The physical tolls of injury or aging are obvious, but what is the impact of Parkinson's or other dementia type afflictions? When that brain of ours starts to fail, tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm your Prairie Doc tonight, Dr. Andrew Ellsworth. Joining us tonight via Zoom is Dr. Kenneth Bartholomew, a Vera Medical Group peer and the author of Disuse Atrophy, Your Brain and Your Future. And via Skype, we're joined by Dr. Jeff Boyle, a Vera Medical Group Neurology, Sioux Falls. Welcome, Ken and Jeff. Let's start with you, Jeff. Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, well, I'm, uh, I graduated from uh, Healand High School in Sioux City and then went to uh, medical school at Nebraska, residency at Iowa, uh, University of Iowa, and then came here to practice at uh, Vera McKinnon. Very good. So I practice uh, neurology and have a, a subspecialty in sleep medicine. Right. Yeah, I know you, uh, you read uh, pretty much all our sleep studies here in Brookings and uh, uh, it's it's quite helpful, so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, made a big difference for a lot of my patients to uh, sleep better and, and get the oxygen at night that they need. And uh, Dr. Bartholomew, uh, Ken, could you tell me a little bit about your background? Well, I graduated from the University of Utah uh, way back in 1976 and uh, did a couple years of postgraduate in Southern California, then moved to South Dakota and. 78 and have been practicing uh, family medicine since 78 so got a couple years under my belt here wonderful and uh jeff how has uh, your practice been impacted by covid 19 now well um it's been uh it's drastically changed the practice so you know we were seeing 10 patients a day most of which were new and um so we've had to triage that means we would see only patients that really uh we were worried about them worsening in the short term and, and something we needed to take care of and um so we're seeing those still if we have to but many patients um especially with neurodegenerative diseases um we've had to say hey it's, it's more dangerous for you to come in then um you know then maybe just wait a few weeks or a few months before we can we can see you and and treat and, and diagnose uh, what's going on so it's it's been hard on our patients um but it's the right thing to do we feel it's the right thing to do right now um to avoid getting uh, this this bad pulmonary infection so are you having them some of them do virtual visits then yep and so we we have been able to see people virtually um and uh, that's uh, new for us, for many of us, and uh, especially new for some of our older patients too. Luckily, there's a lot of family members that can help out um, getting the connection right and, and making sure everything goes smoothly. Yeah, it's uh, in my virtual visit, I, I mean, like what we're doing here, talking over on a, on a screen. Uh, I, I was doing nursing home rounds today and saw uh, a dozen patients in a nursing home uh, over over a screen like this and you know what they did really well it was so nice to see them again too and uh, I just I, I can't imagine for some of them uh, in in the nursing homes uh, without as many visitors so the more we can connect the, with them as many ways as possible the better uh, I'd say um, Ken how has uh, COVID-19 affect things in, in peer for you guys well we we pretty well shut down while we were getting uh, ramped up, um, we did some reorganization and built some barriers on the first floor so that anyone with respiratory symptoms comes in a separate door. Um, and we didn't have hardly any office calls for many days there, expecting to have more of a surge here. Then uh, now we're just slowly opening it back up little by little, uh, seeing more patients and, uh, like I said, doing uh, video conferencing uh, or virtual visits, which is better than a telephone call for sure, but it's just not quite the same as examining the patient. Right, right. Yeah, it, 
it, it, uh, it's going to be tough. Um, thankfully, we, we've done so well in South Dakota and kept our numbers low, and, and hopefully we can open things up and, and see more people and help more people. And, and we know that people still have lots of other medical conditions, which is why we're not really going to talk much about COVID today. And so, um, you know, the first thing I think about is, 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 Jeff, when someone is starting to have some memory problems, what are some of the things you look at to say that there could be some sort of condition going on rather than just old age or uh, just forgetfulness? That's a great question. Um, you know, I constantly go downstairs to the workroom to get a tool and forget what I went down there for. So, I, and I think that's common in, in most age groups. And, um, then, you know, you have other memory problems that are more serious. So, um, for example, if I do my finances and I do my taxes year after year, and then um, one year I, I don't do them right or I don't do them, and then the next year I completely forget, that's, those are uh, things that are, are, something's going on at that point, that it's changing. Um, likewise, if, if, Somebody needs to be prompted with um, naming, you know, such as you know, family members that should be quite familiar to them, or they they lose the um, uh, they start using the wrong name for uh, a you know uh, close uh, family member, such as you they start calling their son um, or their grandson by their son's name, um, you know, and that's it's a persistent thing, not just a one time. Um, event, if it's persistent and they, they can't correct that, it's something that they at least get, you know, come in and get looked at um, and make sure there's nothing, you know, that we can do to, to correct uh, something that might be causing some memory problems um, that, uh, you know, is correctable. It's not, not something else to worry about. So, Ken, if you've got a patient that comes in uh, concerned about their memory loss and, and you're looking at some conditions that could be correctable, what are, what are some of the things you might consider? Okay, I'm, I'm at a little disadvantage here because I keep losing Jeff's audio, so um, I'm not sure what all he said there, but taking it from there, the first thing you're going to do, of course, is a good physical exam um, and then a complete blood panel because there is multiple times when someone has undiagnosed diabetes or one gentleman had a terrible low sodium called hyponatremia. Um, all of these are correctable. Uh, low thyroid called hypothyroidism. These are some of the correctable things that can cause problems that you have to rule out first. You don't, you don't just assume that it's uh, memory loss and start a drug at all. Right, right, Jeff. Uh, I I assume, were you able to hear Ken as well there? Yes, yep. Ken's Great. coming through very clear for me. So. Are, are there some additional uh, conditions you might look for or tests you might want to consider? Um, I usually do a B12 level. Um, that uh, can be common. It's, it's uh, not a deficiency in our diet generally. It's a deficiency in absorption. A vitamin, for, vitamin B12. A vitamin. Where, where, yep. How can we get vitamin B12 usually? It's usually in meat. Um, and uh, so if somebody does have a change in their diet, it, it can be absent in some very strict diets, um, but then it will also um, be low because it's absorbed during a multi-step process. So eating something, something has to be secreted from the, the saliva to get it um, prepared to be absorbed, and then it, it's absorbed in, um, in the small intestine after being processed in the stomach as well. So having three steps to process something and absorb it, it ends up, you, know, you get low on it and then um, memory problems happen. So it's, it's easily correctable. There's injections that we can do and there's absor absorption that you can have through the mouth itself. Um, so that's one condition I always look for. Um, and then of course I'm a sleep doctor, so um, I look for sleep apnea and especially with subtle uh, memory trouble or memory trouble that comes with, you know, a ch change in personality or grumpiness and then of course, uh, snoring or, or sleepiness. Then I, I usually do a uh, sleep study on those individuals too. Yeah, I might add that depression I found can, can really of course affect uh, 
uh, a person's ability to think or do anything and motivation to do anything. And so screening for depression and, and helping treat that can, can sometimes reverse things. According to the Parkinson's Foundation, there is no known cause of Parkinson's disease. It is a progressive and no one course, no one course of therapy works for everyone. I went to a neurologist and got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He asked me before he did anything, he says, what, what brings you here? I said, my wife thinks I've got Parkinson's. And he says, you do. I said, wait a minute, you have, you're just looking at me. He says, yeah, I can tell by the mask on your face that you're a Parkinson's person. That's one of the characteristics of Parkinson's. My dad was the youngest of 13, Dust Bowl mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, brought him to Southern California. They followed the crops all the way up to Northern California. That's where we ended up, but nobody had Parkinson's. 13 brothers and sisters. You know, the tremors I can do away with, the tightness of the arm here, uh, the balance concerns me. You know, if I stood up right now and put one foot in front of the other and shut my eyes, I'd be falling off to one side or the other. You really, you don't typically die of Parkinson's. You die of the fall of being a Parkinson's person. You lose your balance. You hit the concrete, cash out. We've got about 15 people. We share notes and camaraderie and socialize with each other. So keep up on the state of the art medications and therapies that are available. They've all been to yeah, LSBT five. big and loud. I'm the young kid on the block, so I'm just One, going through it now since I've One, retired. Two, three, LSVT loud, it's four times a week, nine, same time, Monday through Thursday nine, for an hour a day nine, for eight weeks. Well, and it's exercises. LSVT big is the physical exercises. Big toe up. Uh, the occupational therapy and then the physical ready? therapy all come into play. One, I've got 13, a list of eight di different exercises that we 14, do, but it's really helpful with the balance and eight, the movement and using different muscles than I do when I'm running. And even in the speech, you're supposed to speak up and that therapy will come down the road. That's, again, my concern is the ability or lack of the ability to speak and swallow. We're very careful, my wife and I are, in the portions of food that I chew up. So, The big and the loud are critical. And stay moving. Don't stop moving. I have friends, and typically 90% of the people in the group, for whatever reason, are male. We've only got two ladies in our support group that have Parkinson's. It's typically with a male. And I can't tell you why that is. You just got to keep moving and stay positive, and that's all I can say. And have a good support network, your family and your friends in the local community. Enough. This is your program, and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. So Parkinson's, uh, Jeff, what is Parkinson's and does it have a, a predilection for uh, men? Are there more men with Parkinson's? It does have a predilection for men. It's about one and a half to two times more common in men than women. Um, and yeah, we, we really don't know what causes it. There's many different theories, whether it's um, autoimmune or, or some other neurodegenerative cause or, or something accumulates in, in the cells of the uh, substantia nigra, which is a, a, par, a part of the brain which is most affected by Parkinson's disease, at least initially. And um, yeah, and we don't know why it, there's a predilection for, for men versus women. And, uh, you know, as far as Parkinson's, when it comes on, I think of uh, Michael J. Fox, you know, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when he was 29. Is there an age when we see this presenting more, more than others? There are um, certain causes that we do know uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease. The most uh, interesting one is a neurotoxin that is made um, in, 
in uh, the synthesis of illicit drugs. And so this has oh. caused uh, young people in Los Angeles in the 1980s when a uh, batch of uh, this drug was made and they took it, and it caused Parkinson's disease in these individuals because of this neurotoxin that they accidentally made and took. And so that's one sort of cause. It's not the, the usual cause for, um, you know, a, a 60 or 70 year old person in South Dakota, but that is one cause. And then there are um, other causes that are genetic. So we do know of, of uh, uh, genetic predisposition that in, in the Parkinson strongly runs in families. And so we see that as well. That that's, could be what um, has manifest in someone like Michael J. Fox to have such an early onset of, of Parkinson's disease. Typically, though, it's in the late 60s or okay. early 70s that people have the most uh, symptomatic presentation. Of course, um, there's other signs that are more subtle. And so um, acting out one's dreams um, can be a very early marker of Parkinson's disease. Of course, there are other causes for that as well, such as severe obstructive sleep apnea. And so um, that acting out of, the, of dreams um, is something that I, I usually recommend somebody is, is seen and, and evaluated um, early on because there are other tests and things we can do for a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. That's really interesting. So when you talk about acting out, is like when they're dreaming, they're doing the things they're dreaming about or? Yeah, okay. yep, correct. So yeah. um, in men, it's there's a, the typical uh, dream is they're fighting someone off. So they, or there are, you know, animals or wolves that are attacking them and they're fighting them off. And so a, a bed partner will look over and see the, the um, husband, you know, looking like they're strangling somebody or fighting somebody, and then they they'll punch, and sometimes they they actually um, strike their bed partner, which is quite um, disconcerting. And you know, there's you know, of course, some guilt with that, which is certainly um, unfounded. But um, and then women will do more crafty things. So they'll be the husband will look over, and and the the wife is sort of knitting you know, in her sleep. And that's usually l less detected, but that's what I have seen before. And so it's really quite interesting. Wow. Yeah, you know, it, these these conditions are just what they're, we don't hardly ever know the cause. And, and, uh, and there's so many different conditions that can overlap for a while. It can be un unclear. When I think about that, Ken, um, can, are there some ways that uh, we can help to prevent our, uh, pr protect our brains uh, or help keep us from, from uh, having you know, atrophy or problems with, with our brain? Well, we don't know of any way to avoid Parkinson's because we really don't know the causes other than the toxins and, and uh, closed head injuries, things like that. But one of the things that I want people to really understand is that we have this huge, huge uh, brain that we don't use. We have around 100 billion cells in our brain and it's estimated from PET scans and different different research that we only use maybe 10 to 20 billion of them in our entire lifetime. So you can actually teach your brain to do new things and work around the damaged area. An example of that is a gentleman I had uh, many years ago when I, when I learned this trick. He had the classic gait problems, you know, the balance and gait problems of Parkinson's disease, and he kept tripping. And he wouldn't think to pick up his feet in time and he would catch his toes. Well, when we sent him to physical therapy, they taught him to think about stepping over a string before he started walking. So he thought a different, usually we don't think about walking, you know, it's just a natural thing for us. And uh, once he, once he thought about the process of stepping over a string, he set up a new neural pathway to make him raise his foot up higher, and it worked. It, it, it lasted for a couple of years. I mean, it's not a cure, but you can train your brain to do new things. And we have this immense potential up there that we pretty much leave untapped. That's great. We do have several questions. I've got one from a Facebook follower. Is it possible that dementia can be caused by anesthesia or morphine after surgery? Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? Or have you heard of that before? 
I've had patients come in and um, uh, mention that that after a you know a, a big cardiac procedure, it's a, a lengthy amount of time under anesthesia, especially, and they'll say, "I just I I don't feel like it was the same after the surgery." Um, there are studies in children, especially, um, and young. Uh, actually, they, they did it in young uh, animals where anesthesia, certain anesthetic uh, agents, especially the ones that are inhaled, do seem to have a neurotoxic effect on brain cells. So um, in children, um, then they tested their IQs. And so the studies, of course, are very, um, uh, they're not very clear because you test kids that have had multiple surgeries before the age of five and they, they may have some other causes for their, you know, that they would need that many surgeries, but they test lower as far as their IQ when compared to, to age match controls. So the, their brothers and sisters seem to test a little bit better. So it does raise the question in, in older adults that are maybe more vulnerable, that have less cognitive reserve, if there is some sort of toxicity that occurs with anesthetic agents to the brain and that sort of tips them over it makes their memory a little bit worse and it and maybe you know so they stop doing their taxes or they stop cooking or they stop um you know being able to drive um you know into the big city so it's 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 something to think about i think um every surgery of course is is something you have to weigh the risks and benefits and that's certainly something that if somebody is having memory trouble i will counsel them and say you should make sure that this surgery is needed and there's no other alternative to um, continue your current lifestyle that, that, um, that you, could, you could undergo. An 82-year-old woman from Sioux Falls who still works part-time drives and works out. She states that people tell her that she ne needs to go in for a memory test or a dementia test. She wonders if she needs one, and if so, what does that entail? Ken, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, we'd have to know why they're telling her that um, if she's if she has obvious memory lapses in their presence, that may be why they're recommending it. Um, I would say that it, she has nothing to lose by doing that, and uh, she may get some helpful insights. Like Jeff mentioned, the B12 level, they'll, they'll almost always recommend that, and you, can, you might find a preventable cause or a correctable cause. What would they so, do for the test for, deme for dementia? How would they? Well, it's, a, it's a multiple page test of uh, memory recall. They'll, they'll ask you to draw. One of my favorites is the clock drawing because if they cannot draw a clock, it really tells you that they're losing uh, executive function. They just can't put the numbers together and get the, the relationships on the clock face right or they, or they forget the hands completely or something like that. But they'll do things like how many animals or how many plants can you name in 60 seconds. And they have scoring, validated scoring uh, structures for these tests. They, get, they can give them an, kind of an objective score, and then they can compare that in six months or a year. So it's, it's certainly worth her while, I think. Yeah. From Yankton, South Dakota, a 78-year-old man had a strange experience yesterday. He had a medical procedure, heart valve replacement, two weeks ago. Yesterday, he had to write out a seven-page draft, and he was, he's done this many times before, and he had a hard time reading his cursive writing. He couldn't correct it. He found a document that he wrote several years ago, and his handwriting was different and easier to read. Any idea what could be causing that? I guess that kind of goes back to the, the, the medical procedure, if it maybe affected his handwriting and his, his ability to read his handwriting. Um, either of you have thoughts on that? Or Ken, I, looks I, like? I certainly do. Um, I have seen multiple times when people have come out of surgery and they appear to have had a small stroke. Um, we've done CAT scans on a gal who is only in her I think she was right around 50 or 52 was all. And um, the scan showed um, a small stroke after a heart procedure. And I've seen it much more often in the elderly. 
to the point where, like Jeff was saying, I will actually go to fairly long length to try to talk them out of surgery if it's something elective like a knee or a hip, unless they just cannot bear the pain because I've just seen it too often where they come out of there not the same. And whether it's a toxic effect or whether it's a microvascular effect, we don't know for sure. I, I have a hunch it's as much the microvascular stroke where they have 80 years of cholesterol buildup and blockage. And then during surgery, their pressure may go down low. Um, something, something else happens where that little area in the brain plugs off and then that tissue dies and they're not the same afterwards. Yeah, it's a, it, a very good point that we really always have to weigh the risks and the benefits of surgery. And there's a lot of different, different parts to that. An emailer asks, we know that the brain needs dietary fat to function. Do you counsel your patients on a high, high fat, very low carbohydrate diet? Um, Jeff, do, do you, have you seen much with, with as far as dietary fat and its impact in the brain? I, I think that um, certainly diet is related to cognitive performance. So um, the extremes of, of sugar levels certainly will affect cognitive function. Uh, high blood sugars and very low blood sugars will affect the, the regular performance. Um, you know, Ken brought up stroke, and so on some on somebody or a patient who has high cholesterol levels already, and then go, undergo a, a specialized diet like the Atkins diet or some high fat, um, high protein, low carbohydrate diet, they really have to be monitored closely that their cholesterol levels aren't going too high because that will eventually lead to cholesterol buildup, hardening of the arteries, and stroke, which of course does um, affect memory and cognitive performance, even small strokes can. So um, I think that, uh, you know, that has to be weighed w with a medical professional and, and maybe a, a dietitian or nutritionist or um, probably a dietitian to, to see if that is appropriate for you. I don't feel that um, there's much data out there to support my recommendation to uh, patients who have a neurodegenerative condition to start a high fat, uh, low carbohydrate diet. Yeah, you know, it always comes down to diet and exercise with almost every medical problem. And if we can uh, do our best to stay active and, and exercise and keep, our, keep, keep the, the brain healthy and, and our muscles healthy and our heart healthy, it's gonna all complement each other, I'd say for sure. Um, Jeff, this the question is probably for you. From Yankton, a woman at, uh, states that her husband failed CPAP and now uses BiPAP, and he's still acting out his dreams. Does he need to be evaluated for Parkinson's or something else? This kind of goes back to what we were talking about mm -hmm. before. It sounds like a situation where it sounds like they may want to consider something else, perhaps, huh? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, the, uh, the third um, cause for dream enactment where somebody will act their dreams out is medications. So that's the other thing I, I really look at closely to see if, if there's any medication like an antidepressant or something else that might be even an antihistamine uh, like a sleep aid will um, make some, will predispose somebody to act out their dreams and not lead necessarily to, to Parkinson's disease. So I, I think, yeah, if, if, um, if they're adequately treated for their CPAP or for their obstructive sleep apnea with BiPAP, then um, they really should think about consulting with a neurologist to see if there's anything else that we have to, to talk about or evaluate for. And of course, CPAP is the continuous positive air pressure, the, the mask pushing air in, and BiPAP, um, where, where it's bi-directional. And can you explain BiPAP a little bit, please? Sure. So the, the, um, there's a lot of work to breathing. Um, it's minimal when it's just, you know, breathing regular pressurized atmospheric pressurized room air, but, um, on CPAP, the pressure is high. And so you have to push out, uh, the air, which doesn't feel right at first You get used to it, but, um, it doesn't feel right. And then, um, if the work of breathing then is becoming higher, we can, um, 
change the pressures so that there's a higher pressure um, going in and then the pressure is lower coming out. And so that that will decrease the work of breathing. And um, there's a there's some other physiologic changes that occurs uh, with BiPAP, but it's sort of a it's oftentimes the next step after somebody has used CPAP and didn't like it, or it wasn't adequately treating their their sleep uh, breathing problem, that we try that that uh, modality. Very good. Um, it, in it at SDSU here in Brookings, there's some you know research going on in a lot of different fields, and and sometimes diseases can be affected by the same genetic anomaly, and here they'll discuss one of them for us. Basically, all mammals have GM1 ganglicide in their body. It's neuroprotective and neuroregenerative, so it protects our brain cells and can help um, nerve cells regrow. I have these lambs that look normal at birth. They grow pretty well for a while, and then they kind of start slowing down. They don't keep up with the other lambs, and eventually they start having a hard time getting around. And so I said, what's going on? So my husband was working um, in a lab where they were working on lysosomal storage diseases. So they called them over, um, and that's when they diagnosed the GM1 ganglicidosis in these lambs. These lambs are missing the enzyme that breaks it down, so they end up with 40 times normal levels of GM1 ganglicide. We work on um, getting the most GM1 ganglicide out of those tissues um, that will eventually hopefully go into the pharmaceutical market to treat patients. There's multiple neurologic diseases that you know the GM1 is applicable for. Um, we started out with spinal cord injury and Parkinson's. Um, in 2012, the first Huntington's paper came out. Applications are for stroke. There's good research on stroke, traumatic brain injury. We were also approached um, about use for uh, glioblastoma, so brain tumors. We eventually would get this down to a, a white powder, and that's the that would be the pure GM1 ganglicide. Then it can be um, rehydrated for patient use. So we feel the best route of administration would be internasal, a high pressure pump that would you know get it across the blood brain barrier into the brain where it needs to go for patients or if they're already symptomatic uh, intrathecal so actually right into the spinal fluid we're coming back around to a lot more interest in natural products um, since we all have it in our body it's not recognized um, it's a natural molecule our body doesn't recognize it as something foreign so there really aren't any side effects the model we've been talking about is one lamb per patient per year. It would be a treatment. They would have to stay on the GM1 ganglicide since our bodies naturally break it down and recycle it. So you'd have to re-administer it probably daily. If you can make $500 on a feeder lamb um, and help somebody else out, it, it, there's a lot of people motivated to do this. I actually have more people interested in raising these lambs than we are able to accept because it's hard to keep the science and the sheep production at the same level. So um, the science is what's lagging right now. So we need to kind of push the science ahead further before we can take more sheep producers. And we would love somebody to partner with us to, to move this forward and get it to patients. Um, we know at least 20 families with Huntington's disease and it is truly the cruelest disease known to man. And it's just so hard watching symptoms and the disease and the demise of our friends as we know we have a very promising treatment. Well, that's really interesting that something we can look at studying that coming right here from, from Brookings uh, Jeff, have you have you seen much about that GM1 glycoprotein research, gl gang GM1 gangliocide research? Yeah, the um, protein itself is uh, it's sort of a Goldilocks protein. So too much of of it causes developmental problems in children, and then in Parkinson's disease, when that that level drops so low in the substantia nigra, which is you know affected in early Parkinson's disease, then there are symptoms there and problems there. So it's you need you can't have too much or too little. You need it just right, and so it's um, something that's being looked at as some uh, potential treatment. Of course, with many of these conditions, 
it's um, it's a question of a of what's causing what and what's the cause and what's the effect. And so it's not known, I think, yet if if GM1 ganglioside uh, deficiency is a critical step in the cause and progression of of um, Parkinson's disease. Having said that, in a rat model of Parkinson's disease, uh, they took a virus with this um, uh, the, with the enzyme that can make this protein, and they injected it into rats that had the rat version of Parkinson's disease, and it seemed like they uh, did better, that these rats didn't get the symptoms and progression of Parkinson's disease that um, that they usually would get. And so it's being looked at as a potential treatment. It's not gone through any human um, trials that I know of, but it's something to keep our eye on. And um, certainly if it's something that, that we can infuse or if it's there's a viral delivery vector, it's something that, that we'll, um, we might be able to do in the, in the years to come. That's fascinating. You know, they also brought up that it could perhaps be helpful for Huntington's disease. Could you tell us a little bit about what Huntington's disease is? It's more there. Sure, Huntington's disease is another kind of movement disorder. Uh, kind of falls in that same group as Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease as as movement disorders. And Huntington's disease is uh, too much movement. So there's a, a dance that they that they do. It's it's almost like a um, they they writhe their arms and sometimes their legs and sometimes their head and that movement they really can't control and it, it doesn't particularly bother them at first but as it worsens it really interferes with the you know like the regular movements of activities of daily living and so it can really affect a person as it progresses and it's a disease that's very highly related to the uh, a genetic uh, problem that's inherited um, and progresses uh, generation by generation. Hmm. An emailer asks, regarding memory and forgetfulness, how do you differentiate between Alzheimer's and frontal lobe dementia? Ken, do you want to talk about frontal lobe dementia versus Alzheimer's some? Well, um, I think there you're going to need the, the MRI scan. Uh, to see where the most pathology is. Um, there's different kinds of memory loss. There's um, emotional changes. Um, some people get very happy and other people get very angry, but there's, there's really no treatment to my knowledge. Yeah, the, the, it can be very devastating. I know with the frontal lobe dementia is how their personality changes, and that can be so hard, hard on the caregivers. Um, Jeff, do you have uh, other thoughts you'd add about the frontal lobe dementia compared to Alzheimer's? How would you differentiate the two? Sure. Um, so Alzheimer's dementia generally starts with, um, you know, just interfering with um, normal conversational memory and and it really seems to be tied in with the temporal lobes which which is that that language part of the brain and then integrating that conversational memory into behavior and decisions and so um, that's what some people will will come in and tell me in clinic is that they repeat the same conversation or they answer a question this the same question several times for their their loved one and then that might be a maybe an early sign for for Alzheimer's dementia, depending on the severity. Meanwhile, you sit down with folks with Alzheimer's disease and you say, "How are you doing?" and and how the how are your kids? And they'll they'll carry on just like a just like a normal pleasant conversation. And um, a frontal lobe dementia then is a little different. They they do have you know like Ken said a lot of behavioral changes and behavioral problems and. And they won't want to talk as much, and and they'll be, you know, a, a, somewhat avoidant sometimes or angry, and so it's it's different. They they might remember conversation a little bit better, but certainly they don't engage in it as much because of that um, that change in behavior. A viewer on Facebook asks, "What can you do legally if you suspect your loved one has dementia?" 
Now, I don't know for sure what they're uh, talking about as far as taking responsibility or, or taking over control of finances, but uh, um, what are some of the things you look at, you know, if, if you suspect loved, uh, legally, if, if your loved one has dementia? I can go at that one. Yes, please, Ken. So actually in the last two years, I've had to write two letters to the uh, chief of police here to get um, the keys taken away from elderly people who are driving and whose family witnessed them being dangerous. They're getting lost, uh, driving erratically, etc. So that took a, actually a police uh, visit to convince them that they had a problem because they thought they were doing just fine. Then beyond that, you need to get them uh, the memory testing, uh, probably scanned a complete blood analysis and make sure there's no correctable causes. And then they need to apply for a uh, durable power of attorney uh, or power of attorney for their legal, their legal um, bank accounts, things like that. Uh, it's it's quite a process, but if you've got a family physician who will work with you on it, he can kind of walk you through the steps. Um, you've got to dot the I's and cross the T's, but you have to prove that they're incompetent to make uh, decisions. And it can take many weeks to months to get through the whole process. Very good. Um, also, a viewer on Facebook asks, about Parkinson's disease in the U.S. and if, if the rate of that disease is growing relative to the past decades. Um, I don't know if, if, if uh, Jeff, do we know, is, there, is, that, is Parkinson's increasing? I think Parkinson's is just so closely related to age uh, progression that since there is a you know, generally larger population coming through as uh, called the baby boomers generation, they're, they're just a general um, and they're a bigger generation than other generations. They are older now and they're getting to be in that Parkinson's disease um, onset range. And so it is increasing. Having said that, there are other risk factors for developing Parkinson's disease. Now, risk factors are not causes, but they do seem to go along with the, um, uh, you know, the, the increase of chance of getting it. One is rural living. And, and exposure to pesticides uh, is another uh, risk factor that we know of. And so it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm not aware of outside of the age, age population increasing that the Parkinson's disease uh, is increasing uh, because of some other cause. I, I think it's something that we really are going to be looking at. I think the other factor in seeing a disease increase in prevalence, that means increase in the number of cases in the population, is that we're just more aware of it and and better at diagnosing it, recognizing it, and, um, and getting the numbers uh, to be more true to what's happening in, in um, the population. So those are just different things that I think about when I hear numbers that are, are saying that the that the diagnosis or the disease is, is becoming more prevalent. That's great. A woman from Sturgis, South Dakota asked, can medications for epilepsy like Dilantin cause dementia? Um, I can take that one. Yeah. The um, epilepsy drugs uh, have come through in many different generations. And I'm sorry, I want and... to clarify that epilepsy is a seizure disorder when someone yes. has seizures. Yep, yep, thank you. Yeah, and, and so epilepsy drugs early on in the, you know, 50s, 60s, and then 70s were very powerful. And we really appreciated their use to stop seizures. And then as we've become better with chemistry and better with the, the neurobiology of these seizures and epilepsy, we've been able to hone in on better drugs that are have less side effects and there are... Uh, more nuanced and more able to treat epilepsy with less side effects. So there were conditions that um, went along with long-term treatment with epilepsy drugs. Um, and it's they are movement problems. They, they don't seem to um, 
lead right into epilepsy or into um, Parkinson's disease per se, but but um, the cerebellum is a part of the brain that is involved in balance and coordination, and it's it's uh, really a very um, close um, partner with the basal ganglia, which which is uh, the main part of the brain that controls movements, and then the cerebellum then makes your movements smooth and very precise. And so the cerebellum is actually very sensitive to medications that slow that uh, neuronal discharge down. And when the, that uh, when epilepsy, you have a, a abnormal discharges that occur and they're too fast and they're not normal discharges, we slow those down with these epilepsy drugs. But unfortunately, the older generations of epilepsy drugs, such as, as uh, phenytoin or dilantin, would also affect these cells in the cerebellum. And so I've seen several patients, you know, in their 60s, 70s, or 80s that have had 50, 60 years of dilantin use at a pretty high dose, and they are very clumsy and they can't walk anymore. And it's not necessarily Parkinson's disease, um, but it's, it is related to movement. And so it's something that I always encourage people that are, even with the, if they have good seizure control on Dilantin, I would like to work at getting them onto a newer drug that I know um, doesn't cause those movement problems. Very good. As we're getting towards the end here, um, Ken, you know, as people are taking care of their loved ones at home and maybe self-quarantined at home to help keep them safe, but maybe their loved one has dementia, um, are there, is there some advice you'd, you'd give them right now? During the quarantine During period. the quarantine and COVID, yes. Yes, um, I actually have one, one family who's uh, taking care of uh, the elderly mother, and they're taking turns uh, because it gets pretty hard on one person um, when they have that much responsibility and they're not getting out. So this family is uh, taking turns going yeah. to mom's house and uh, take a, doing their own um, social distancing on their own so they don't bring it into the house to her. But at least they're cooperating and not leaving it all on the one uh, sibling. I, I agree. Uh, it's so important to to try to share the load and, and give give relief when you can and find ways and, you know, and, 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 and sometimes you can help and uh, give them a break and, but help them virtually or something like this too. So thank you again so much. I, I do want us to get to Dr. Holmes' essay. Uh, before his death earlier this year, Dr. Holmes wrote and recorded tonight's essay. It is good to hear and see him again and we all miss him greatly. We'll be right back after this. We feel privileged to have had the honor of creating a legacy of service through the Prairie Doc organization. It has been our desire and goal to share health information that is not influenced by marketing or sales, but rather is based on science. We started in the 80s with a newspaper article and expanded in the 90s with a radio show. In 2003, we started a TV program, and in 2010, we added our social media platforms. This has been a team effort made possible by many volunteer physicians and experts serving as hosts and guests. All of them are Prairie Docs. Thanks to them, we've been given the ability to pass the torch so that this legacy may continue beyond my time on this earth. Please join me in embracing our team of Prairie Doc physicians, each committed to this mission. Family physician Andrew Ellsworth, Deb Johnston, and Jill Cruz, along with internist Kelly Evans, all from Brookings, South Dakota. These volunteer physicians, and many others, have in the past and will in the future serve as authors of Prairie Doc newspaper columns, host of our TV and radio programs. Thank, Thank you. you. Mrs. R was a character. Her natural red hair had changed to gray years earlier, but thanks to the magic of her hairdresser, her hair was again flashy red and she had a personality to match. She was a feisty, fun, and full-blooded woman, full of zest and pizzazz. She made me smile whenever I made rounds at the nursing home. 
Through the years, Alzheimer's disease took its toll on her memory, but her spirit, brightness, and spark didn't seem to fade much. Even near the end, as the family stopped the hair coloring, she gave me a charge of energy and vitality whenever we met. However, the neurodegenerative, or ND, Alzheimer's condition didn't let up, and eventually she slipped off this earthly existence gently while family surrounded her with love. The image of my redheaded friend repeatedly came to me through the years as I cared for people with ND diseases. Neurodegenerative brain loss conditions include amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. These heartbreaking conditions happen because of brain cell death, but we don't know what kills the brain cells. We do know that in 2016, 5.4 million Americans were living with Alzheimer's, and we estimate 930,000 people will be living with Parkinson's by 2020. Presently, a lot of research is being done to look for exposure to certain toxins as a cause for ND diseases to include pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, metals like arsenic, lead, and manganese, polychlorinated biphenols, or PCBs, and other human-made and natural toxins in the environment, including tobacco. We simply do not know the cause or causes, but we're looking hard. When a person has one of these largely untreatable conditions, we utilize tools called activities of daily living to define when that person might need more help. The five ADLs include one, personal hygiene, being helped to bath, groom, and brush teeth and hair. Two, continence management, being able to independently use the toilet. Three, dressing, selecting and wearing appropriate clothes. Four, feeding oneself. And five, ambulating, or being able to change position and to get around by oneself with or without an assisted device or wheelchair. Losing ability to do one or more ADLs certainly means that help is needed. If not now, coming around the corner. Mrs. R had a great life, and although she struggled with an ND brain condition, she didn't lose her spirit and color until the very end. Miss you, Mrs. R. A big thank you to our guests, Ken and Jeff. Having to connect remotely to answer these difficult questions is challenging, and they did it well. We have a request for you all at home. Is there a subject about which you would like us to do an on-call with the Prairie Doc episode? Please send us your thoughts, either a message on our Facebook page or email to us at prairiedoc.org. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. We're done with the heavy coats and shoveling snow, but now we are up against grass growing, trees budding, and flowers blooming. Allergy season is here, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. All of us want our family, neighbors, and friends to have the ability to make appropriate decisions about their health care. To do so, they need access to information from reliable sources like Dr. Holm and his guest physicians. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the volunteer board of directors of the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 organization established to support the work of the Prairie Docs. With your charitable donation, you can help the foundation continue to offer free and easy access to the entire library of Prairie Doc health education programs. This mission is so very important to rural communities and residents in particular across South Dakota and neighboring states. Please consider a personal or corporate gift. Just go to prairiedoc.org to find more information on how you can help. Thank you.
Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Black Hills Medical Society. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society. Sioux Falls District Medical Society. Yankton District Medical Society. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. And Swiftel Communications. 